Hello? Good, good morning. Uh, yes, after this, Joanna and I have to scurry out, get in our car, and drive to Hume Lake. Uh, and uh, we really, really want to thank you. You saved us from the bus. <laughs> they, they, they said, do you want to preach on Sunday? And I was like, yes. That means I can take my own car, and I'll be quiet, and I'll have air conditioning, and I can listen to the music I want to listen to, and there's no yelling in my ears, and I can just take a nice, peaceful drive up to the mountains. Yes. So we are in deep appreciation. Thank you. Uh, they're safe. They're safe, though. There's adults with them. Don't worry. Uh, I don't know who, but there's... I think we paid somebody, somebody that was just walking by. Um, can you watch these kids? Sure. Yeah. Uh, in, in youth group, in the, when we do our youth uh, nights, we have a little book that we use sometimes as a discussion starter. And it's called Would You Rather? And I'm going to do a little Would You Rather right now, OK? And it means that you're going to have to do a little more talking amongst yourselves. You'll be talking to the person on your left or the right or in front or behind. Try not to talk to somebody you already know, because then they know your answers. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, why is that funny? All right, we're gonna, here's your question, OK? Would you rather be blind or deaf? And the rule with would you rather is you can't put conditions on. You can't say, well, how blind or how deaf. No, no, no. And, you can't, and you can't say neither. OK, that's not an option. So you're going to turn to the person next to you or in front of you behind, going to ask, would you rather be blind or deaf, or at least answer that question for yourself, and then give a little tiny explanation to them really quickly as to why. OK, ready, go. All right. Oh, you should all know a little something about someone next to you uh, as interesting or. OK. <laughs> uh, I want to share something with you. My dad, my father, he's a concert cellist. And he's been a musician his entire life. And if he were to be asked this question, he would say, I would like to lose my sight because my father would want to hear music still. He couldn't imagine a life without music. He couldn't imagine a life that way. And that is a, a really beautiful thing. Um, I would rather be deaf, because I still want to be able to drive my car. <laughs> I'm shallow. Um, in a moment, I want to do another exercise with you. And we're going to play a little piece of music. And it's just going to be in the background. And you're going to close your eyes. And just as your word of warning right now, don't fall asleep. OK? <laughs> it's going to be tempting, I know. So I want you to just to picture a place, all right? It doesn't have to be a place you've actually been or, or, or have ever seen before. Just picture a, a place as the music is playing. And I want you just to like have those images in your head. Just, let, just you know, relax and let yourself go off to some place. Exactly. So close your eyes.
did you see? Where were you? Anyone? Anyone? Yes? Yeah? Okay. That was very vivid. Did you have breakfast this morning? <laughs> Anybody else? Yes? Kind of like in a forest? Okay. Anyone else? Yes? I was in a beautiful English garden. Beautiful green, lots of overgrown trees. Very and Victorian English garden. A Victorian English garden. Was there a castle in the background? Were there white wigs? We didn't get that far. Okay. <laughs> you went further on, and she was just out in the courtyard. Okay. It's <laughs> odd. You guys should get together afterwards. Does anybody uh, know that song? Who was that song by? Yes? It was Moonlight Sonata, yes, by Beethoven. Beethoven, yes. Um, it, that song is a masterful interpretation of sound to depict an actual place, a moonlit night. And that music was created because Beethoven himself wanted to give some of his talent, something of himself, to a blind girl. This was a lady who could not see a beautiful moonlit night, and she could not see trees or grass or stars or shimmering lakes, and Beethoven put his genius to work so that through his talent, through his gift, he could offer a little piece of sight for her, someone that could not see. And because of that, you and I are now blessed with having this song. I would like to invite you to turn to Mark. We're going to look at Mark chapter 8. And if you don't have a Bible, there's pew Bibles in your pews. You can find it on page 690. In the very popular hymn that we know, Amazing Grace, the hymn writer, John Newton, writes, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, and now I'm found, was blind, and now I see. That's a common expression amongst Christians, right? We, we say that, we use that uh, in our dialogue. We say, I was blind, and now I see. We relate to this story. Even though you and I were never physically blind, we use this as our own story. And today I wanted to look at an actual blind but now I see story. So we're in Mark 8, and we're going to start at verse 22. They came to Bethsaida. Now, in this very church, I have heard this place pronounced many different ways. And let's learn to say it right now, because it's not Bethesda. Jesus did not go to Maryland. <laughs> this is not Bethsaida, because then it would be I-A, okay? It's Bethsaida, like that. So I know it's odd that that I is really an uh, not an A. I didn't spell it, but that's how it's pronounced. Bethsaida. Bethsaida is a small town. It's a small Palestinian fisherman village. It actually, the, the town name means House of the Fishermen, and this is where Andrew and Peter and Philip were all born. So verse 22 continues. And some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes, and then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, Don't even go into the village. I was blind, and now I see. So let's unpack this passage for a minute, okay? Jesus is in this small Palestinian fisherman's village. The people there learn that Jesus is there, and they go off and grab the town blind man and drag him to Jesus, right? And who brings this guy? It doesn't say. His friends, strangers, it doesn't say. Why do they bring him? It doesn't say. It just says they drag the town blind guy to Jesus, right? 
Jesus, heal this guy. Heal that guy. Heal him. Please, come on, do it. Oh, come on. I mean, make this guy see. Right? And it's kind of like your grandfather who can wiggle his ear, you know, or your uncle that can do that magic trick. Please do it, Jesus. Come on. We want to see you do it. But I, I would think that perhaps because Jesus doesn't want to be on display, doesn't want to make this into a big spectacle, he takes the man by the hand and he leads him out of the town. Poor guy. Can you imagine being the town blind guy? You're sitting by, you know, a wall so that you don't fall over and you got your cup for money. And then strange people, like, pick you up and start taking you off someplace and they're all excited. And, and then you hear this big argument and a scuffle and you don't know what's going on. And then someone you don't know, whose voice you've never heard before, is now taking you slowly out of town. Uh, this story is unique for a couple of different reasons. First, it's only found in Mark. It's the only time Jesus ever spits on someone. And it's the only miracle that happens in stages. And we'll get to that. So Jesus leads the man out of the city and then he spits on him. So turn to your neighbor right now and spit in their eyes. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Stop. I was kidding. And then he says, what do you see? Let's talk about spit for a minute. There's a sentence you didn't think you'd hear in church this morning. You and I, you and I we read spit, we read that word, and we think to ourselves, Bleh, gross, right? But if you wanted to heap an insult on somebody or curse somebody, right? Your old Italian grandmother, she spits on somebody, right? That's, it's from the old country. Uh, but what happens if you get a scrape or you get a boo-boo on your knee? Your mom comes along and she kisses it, right? Or if you have like a dirt smudge on your forehead, your mom licks her thumb and she wipes it off, right? It's, it's magic, exactly. So we recognize that there's a healing power and there's kind of like a cleaning power to spit. And in ancient days, spit was seen as a miracle cure. Spit has life in it. I mean, it does. And as gross as that sounds. And so Jesus then, he spits on the cursed or the diseased or the broken part of this man. And he asks him, what do you see? And the man says back, I see people. Actually, he says he sees people and they look like trees, which the tree comment and the spitting, I think, coupled together in, in this story is what makes this story kind of memorable to us. First of all, I think that this part of the story tells us that this man wasn't born blind. You know, if, if you're starting to receive your sight back and you say, well, what do you see? And you say, uh, I see people and they look like trees, then he has to know what a tree looks like. So I would venture to say that he probably lost his sight through life. And that's common. Uh, there are many different ways that you can lose your sight. You can lose your sight through disease like uh, cataracts and glaucoma and uvatus and trachoma. You can lose your eyesight through injury. You can lose your eyesight through birth defect. You can lose your eyesight through poison. And why say people look like trees, though? Why, why would you pick trees? Well, I, I think both are tall and upright, stationary. Perhaps both are slender, perhaps sometimes motionless. My grandmother right now is losing her sight. Uh, Joanna and I, a couple weeks ago, we had the opportunity to go back to Sacramento, and I was able to see my grandmother on her 92nd birthday. And she is almost blind. And she came up to me, and she said what she always says is, uh, it's nice to see you. And then I say back what I always say, it's nice to be seen. Because if my grandmother just took four or five steps backwards, I would just be a tall, slender, motionless object to her. All right, maybe not tall, but... <laughs> I, so she, she's either going to recognize me by my voice or only if she walks up close to me, okay? So can you imagine what it would be like to be slowly losing your sight? You see your friend off in the distance, you walk up to him, start talking to them, and then realize, oh, this is a tree. <laughs> so the man says, I see people, and I know they're people because they're walking around. There's activity, there's motion, there's life. The darkness that this man had been living in is, is becoming clear. The haziness that has been his life for so long is coming into focus. And 
how amazing is it that the first guy that this man gets to see is Christ, you know? I, I think this story has so much relevance for us today. There is still a great need to see God clearly. And then you and I, who adopt this symbol of having once been blind, but now we see, we become a huge part of this miracle. Because that was us, right? We were the blind person. There was a time in our lives, no matter how small, when we walked in darkness and we couldn't see. There was a time when you and I didn't know truth. And then what happened? Somebody brought us to Jesus, and he gave us life. Someone carried us to Jesus, and he healed us. Someone allowed us to fall at Christ's feet, and he forgave us. And our lives have never been the same. And I would offer that this blind man, his life has probably never been the same. So what now? What happens next? The man receives his sight, and Jesus tells him, go and tell everybody what has happened to you. Go show everybody, right? No. What does it say in verse 26? The man saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. In other words, don't go back. Why? What's going on here? I mean, isn't that the point of the whole gospel? That Jesus re brings restoration. Jesus brings healness. Now go and tell others about Christ. Let me give you a piece of advice. When you're reading scripture, and you're reading maybe just a passage or a story, and it's a little confusing to you, and you're like, oh, I don't get that. Read more. Keep reading. Uh, read the story following it. Read the story ahead of it. Go to another part of the Bible and, and read. The more we read, the more these stories become unveiled to us. So let's continue in Mark 8. Mark 8, verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. What about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. So, how different are these two stories? They're pretty much the same, because the disciples only half saw who Jesus really was. Even though they were with him every day, even though they spent you know, their lives with this guy, they still didn't know him. Who am I, you guys? Uh, a prophet? Right? And, and, and Peter then opens their eyes to the truth. And then in both stories, the people who now clearly see Jesus are told not to go back to their village, are told not to tell anybody what has happened or what they learned. Why does Jesus say this? Sometimes I think we say, oh, it's because it wasn't his hour. You know, it wasn't his time. Jesus wasn't really ready to reveal himself. Okay, but this story takes place after Jesus sends out the 12. It takes place after he feeds the 5,000, after calming the storm, after raising a widow's son back from the dead, after Jesus had already dodged religious leaders who tried to kill him. I'd like to suggest that Jesus didn't say these things in private to keep people in darkness or to keep them shrouded in secrecy. Jesus said these things so that the right people would see. Jesus wasn't looking to be a celebrity. He wasn't looking to be a pop icon. Fanaticism, that just brings the media and the paparazzi and the gawkers and the looky-loos, right? They would just hound him. Jesus, do a miracle. Heal this guy. Make this blind guy see. Uh, multiply this bread. Uh, walk on water, right? They just wanted to see miracles. They just wanted to see magic tricks. And you know what? Miracles were not the point. Healing was the point. Restoration was the point. Hey, if I told you a secret and then I said, don't tell anybody, right? Who would you tell? Right? Because you tell somebody. If I said, hey, I got a secret, but don't tell anybody, you'd be like, all right, I'm totally telling my wife, right? <laughs> or, or my husband will kill me if I, if I don't tell him this. 
We'll, we'll tell our husband, or we'll tell our wife, or we'll, we'll tell the person that's the closest to us, or we'll tell the people that we love, or we'll tell the people that are in our family. And you know, I don't think Jesus is asking you to go on TV to tell others about him. I don't think he's telling you, go door to door and, and pass out pamphlets. But maybe, maybe the message of Jesus, maybe the good news is something that we share with the people that we love and the people that are closest to us, the people that know our secrets. Because all through the scriptures, we read that the, the people that hear the word of God, they're God's chosen people. They're God's elect. They're God's few. They are the people that walk the narrow path. So when I look around this room, I could ask you the same question. What do you see? I see people. Another thing that, I love sharing things about myself. Uh, David in a microphone is a dangerous thing. Uh, another thing I can tell you about myself is that I am an artist. When I was going through college originally, I wanted to be an art major, and that was the plan until God made me fail all my classes. <laughs> but that's another story. But one of the things you learn in art is that it's not so much about the subject matter. The entire picture is relevant. And there is something in the picture besides the subject, and it's the background. And some people, and artists will call this the negative space. All right? So if you look at this picture up here, this is the Heaven's Gate Temple in Beijing. Now, the black is the negative space. And it's just as important as the subject, because the negative space is now helping to define the subject. Can you see that? Do you have any photographers here? Jennifer Enriquez, Mocktail. OK. You guys agree, right? Negative space is important. It's just as important. When you're taking those family pictures, you've got to think about negative space, too, because it's going to help your, uh, your picture. So if I were going to take a picture like that of uh, our sanctuary, and I <laughs> threw it up on the screen, what would our family portrait look like? What would the negative space look like? Let me help you out just a little bit. Um, through summer, through this past summer, it's almost over, second service has averaged in attendance about 150, give or take, OK? 150. Now, our sanctuary holds 400 people. Somebody whistle. Yes. So I'm going to do a little exercise with you. I didn't do this in first service because I'm not that daring. Uh, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to slide that way. OK, so everybody slide this way. Everybody slide that way. You can slide. Mark wants you to buff those seats there. Now we want to dust them later. Make a nice big wide aisle, OK? Just slide on down. Scooch, scooch, mama, mama. Scooch, scooch. <laughs> now, Sue's looking down. She's like, "Wow." I want, and I just wanted to see this too. I just wanted to see what that looks like, okay? Because sometimes we don't see what it looks like. You know, We're, we see in a way that makes it. I'm not talking to anybody. <laughs> we. We sit in a way that kind of looks like there's, more, there's less space than there really is, you know? And we don't really see how much space there is. And I'm not saying this to make you guys feel bad. I'm actually saying this to excite you. I mean, this should actually be exciting. That we have, we, we could have this many more family members, you know? Because it, does, it, does it feel nice to sit nice and close and snug? No? <laughs> you didn't mean that. All right, you guys can go back. Unless you like staying like that. <laughs> my first thought was to move you all to the back. And then I thought, oh my gosh, that's going to take forever. So tell your friends that David got us do musical chairs. Remember this illustration. The negative space, the negative space helps define the subject matter, right? 
you and I were once blind, and now we see. And there is still a great need for the world to see God. I want you to notice two things about this story. First, the blind man was led to Jesus, right? Whoever these people were, or whatever their intentions were, they had to lead this man to Christ. He was incapable of getting to the healing on his own. He could not find the peace and this love and this restoration by himself. He had to be led by others. He had to be led by people who could see. You and I claim to see. We claim to be followers of Christ who can see truth and who know where to find wholeness and restoration and peace. We say we see Jesus, but do we see people? Who are we leading to Christ? Who are the blind people that are in your town and are in your city and that are in your family and that are at your job and that are at your grocery store and that are at your bank? Who is it that you could take by the hand and say, come on, i got somebody for you to meet? Second, Jesus led the blind man to healing and to wholeness. And I would say, this is something that Christ is still doing, amen? amen. I would think that Jesus wants to still lead people to transformed lives. Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah saying about himself, God's spirit is on me. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor, sent me to pronounce pardon to prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the burdened and the battered free and to announce this is God's year to act. That was Jesus' mission statement. That was his sermon series for three years. For three years before the cross, Jesus proclaimed a message of wholeness, of restoration, of equality, and of the blind receiving sight. And today, Jesus still wants to lead people to wholeness and to restoration. So let's talk a little bit about the um, uniqueness of this miracle. Because it's, it is interesting that this miracle happens in stages, isn't it? And I do think it's odd when we think about this miracle, but if I take this miracle and couple it alongside my own journey and my own walk, then I can see that it's really not that different because when I was first led to Jesus, I didn't see him completely. I didn't know him all at once. I didn't get it all. There was still more that had to be explained. There was still more that had to be open to me. And I think it's so sad that we'll bring someone to Christ their eyes will be opened, they'll fall on their knees, they'll cry out, I can see! And then what happens? We hand them a new believer's Bible, we scuttle them off to a classroom, and then we're off to find the next person. And I would think that people who can see for the first time, they still need to be rehabilitated. New believers still need friends who are willing to come alongside them and show them and teach them and model for them Christ. There is still a great need to see God clearly. A favorite analogy of mine is that the church is not a social club. It's a hospital. This is a hospital. What good is a hospital with no sick and no broken and no diseased and no hurting and no lost and no dirty? It would just be a building with a bunch of perfect, happy doctors. And what fun is that? Just doctors sitting around in their lab coats. What's up? Hey. What'd you do today? Nothing. Right? A hospital needs broken. A hospital needs sick. A hospital needs diseased. That's what a hospital should be. And I think a hospital without those things, I would wonder, well, why does the hospital exist? So what can we do? How can we better see people? How can we better lead the blind to Christ? Service. Ephesians 2.10, God does both the making and saving, and he creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work of others. In the work he does, sorry. So often I am asked by students, all right, now what? How do I take my faith to that next level? How do I get out of this. I feel like my faith is kind of plateaued. You know, I know every Bible story, Tower of Babel, David and Bathsheba, right? I, I know all the worship songs. I know all the hand motions to Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Okay, am I supposed to just keep coming to church every Sunday? Is, 
that how I know God more? I think, what should I do? I, I feel like my faith has just kind of like hit its high point and I don't know what to do now. My answer is always the same, service. Service. It's the Christ in action. It's our faith in the doing. Because the church, this is, it's not just about when we gather, you know? It's about when we scatter. It, the church is the church the seven days of the week. This together, this is just worship service. This is just coming together and celebrating our maker. But the church, the body of Christ, is in the everyday. It's in the 24-7. It's the you and I out there in the world showing a blind world Christ. What can you do with the talents and the motivations and the gifts and the things that get you riled up? What can you do with those things that would uniquely allow you to draw others to see Christ? Surrender. Luke 9, 23. Then Jesus said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him first deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. What does that mean? Take up your cross. That doesn't carry the same weight in this world as it did back then. You and I, we don't really understand cross. This is how one Bible translation puts it. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me, and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself, your true self. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? And if any one of you is embarrassed with me and the way I'm leading you, know that the Son of Man will be far more embarrassed with you when he arrives in all his splendor in the company of the Father. You and I can know the peace. You and I can show the shalom of Christ and the healing of Christ to others when we surrender ourselves, when we submit to God. Some of us are worried about acting Christian, you know, in front of other people because we're too afraid to take a stand or to say that we have a belief about something or that we have a conviction about something. And Christ says, hey, guess what? It's not about you. It's about me. How terrible is it going to be for you to gain a worldly life when you lose a heavenly one? When we surrender to God, wives, when you submit to your husbands, children, when you obey your parents, you are showing a blind world, Christ. Sacrifice. Now, I don't know what it is for you, but we all need to sacrifice something. Sometimes it means sacrificing a relationship. Others, it's time or money or influence or popularity. Sometimes it means living in the worst part of town or in the worst part of the world. There is something that God has been calling you to, something that he has been trying to tell you, but because it requires you to sacrifice something, you have been negligent to do it. It just doesn't fit with your plan. For some reason, you know better than God how your life should go, and you're just still holding on to the vision of how you think your life should be. Jesus says in Matthew, don't think I've come to make life cozy. I've come to cut, to make a sharp knife cut between son and father, daughter and mother, bride and mother-in-law, cut through all those domestic arrangements and free you for God. When we serve God and his church, when we surrender our lives completely, when we make sacrifices for God, we show a blind world, Christ. And there is still a great need to see God clearly. So, may you begin to see blind people and may you lead the blind to Christ because Jesus still wants to open the eyes of those who can't see. May you have a heart for the very things that God has a heart for and for the people that God has a heart for. And may your witness be governed by a ministry of service, of sacrifice, and surrender. Let's pray. Dear Lord, may we have sight for what you have sight for. 
may we hear the things that you hear. And Lord, sometimes our own life is just so crowded and noisy and things just get in the way. And Lord, we just ask that you quiet those things and may we stop and listen and be still and know your heart and the things that you have a heart for. May we be your servants. May we be your hands and your feet, your eyes and your mouth in this world. May those who don't know you find you. And may we come alongside you and join you in the work that you are already doing. So Lord, empower us, strengthen us, envision us, motivate us, fill us with your spirit. We thank you, Lord, for your blessing, for your forgiveness, for the salvation of heaven, for the restoration of sin. Lord, there are no words. We praise you in your son's name. Amen.